We live in a world of infinite shades of gray, not just 50. <laughs> Ambiguity is a virtue. If you actually insist on objective truth, that is close-minded and offensive. And this is the lie that we are living today, that your sexual desires define you, determine you, and should always delight you. But since the fall of Adam and Eve, the human heart has set itself in defiance against God's ways. This idolatry of sexuality, this celebration of sexual freedom, fortunately, is on a collision course with the gospel as my life was on a collision course with the gospel. Now, you might wonder why did Phoenix Seminary, and Phoenix Seminary invite me to speak on this really light, non-controversial topic <laughs> of sexuality. Well, it's not an intellectual exercise for me. It's not something that I might have written on. It's very real and personal. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My parents raised me with very traditional Chinese values. And if you're unfamiliar with Chinese values, let me help you. Obey your parents, do well in school, and practice piano. <laughs> I had this secret that I kept hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps reserves. In my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet, and I began living openly as a gay man in the gay community. So I decided to go home and break the news to my parents, and I told them, I am gay. It was my declaration. Amazingly, though, through that crisis, my mother came to faith. And then within a few months, my father did as well. Well, I went the total opposite direction, wanted nothing to do with Christianity. I spent most of my free time with gay clubs. I went from relationship to relationship, seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found, but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. And to be clear, not all gay men do drugs. Some do, some don't. I'm just telling my story. But drugs do cost money, and I supported my habit by selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor, which I don't suggest. You see, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was received my doctorate, the administration of the school expelled me. So my parents flew, me, flew from Chicago, where we used to live, to Louisville, where I was going to dental school. And I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. My father was a dentist. He knew the dean very well. All they needed to do was to threaten a lawsuit, and I would stay in school for three months and get my doctorate besides. Isn't that what any good Chinese parents should do anyway? To my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mother told the dean, it is not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And she said, they're going to support whatever decision the school made. My mom knew that when it comes to her kids, nothing is more important than her children following Jesus. Even more important than education, even more important than career. But the sad reality is many people in America may go to church on Sunday and worship God, but then they'll return home and worship idols, the idol of education, the idol of career, the idol of their 401k. And often we force our kids to do the same. Our parents putting more emphasis upon their children getting the homework done, getting a better grade, getting good, into a good school, all good things. Or should Christian parents be putting more emphasis, actually the most emphasis, upon our kids following Jesus? Nothing is more important than that. But to be honest, I was not happy about mom's decision. She wasn't on my side. I fell. She was on the school side. So I moved further away from them, further away from Chicago to the bright lights and big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community, and I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no clue that I was doing drugs, but they knew that my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So they tried to reach out to the love of Christ, and I wanted nothing to do with it. They came to visit me one time in Atlanta, and I told them to get out. 
We hear the narrative today that Christian parents cannot, are not able to love their gay child. They have to throw the Bible away. They have to reinterpret it. They have to envision a widening of God's mercy. I had the exact opposite experience. My parents weren't Christian. They couldn't accept me. It wasn't until they became followers of Christ, they knew they could do nothing other than to love me as God loved them while they were still sinners, while they were enemies. So they came to visit me. I kicked them out. Before my dad left, he gave me his very first Bible. Had the notes in the margins. He was all dog-eared. And I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. He left it on my kitchen counter, walked out the door. And as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible and I threw it in the trash can. I wanted nothing to do with God and certainly nothing to do with the Bible. And it was so obvious to my parents that I was hopeless. But my mom and dad committed not to focus on hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over a hundred prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mom began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would spend hours every morning in her prayer closet, reading the Bible, crying out to God, interceding for me, for many, many others. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the Father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door. On my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Atlantic City Detention Center. So I tried calling my friends. You know those type of friends that say, whenever you need something, just give me a call. Those friends that get me more into trouble than anything else. Well, what I didn't know was I had a praying mother at home. Watch out. And she knew that as long as I have those type of friends around, I would find no need for God and no need for my parents. Remember, she loves bold prayers. Well, she had prayed specifically years ago that somehow, some way, God would cause all of those friends to desert me. And on that day, not one friend answered my collect call. So you moms out there, beware of your prayers. They're going to come true. <laughs> so I was down to the bottom of the list home and I did not want to make that phone call as I imagined the earful that I was going to get on the other line but mom's first words were son are you okay no condemnation no berating words just words of unconditional love and grace the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice how Paul isn't saying that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath, but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was 
excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not, because I hadn't called home in years and she knew this was God's answer to her prayers. So she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears she knew she had to do like that good old hymn says. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, no matter what heartache she was enduring, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down and next to the phone was a calculator, a counting machine. And she tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is, is in a safe place <laughs> compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And when I got out of prison, this list of blessings was longer and taller than she is. Both sides. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block. And if I could just be blunt with you, I was doing everything that I could to stay to myself. You know, I wasn't going to mingle with those really, really bad people, you know, those criminals. <laughs> and I passed by this garbage can. And if you've never been to jail before, they don't, take the they don't take the trash out every day. So it was a mound of trash. It smelled, it reeked, flies were circling around it. And I looked at this and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates. I was just three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. And now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can. But something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up. And it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book for the first time. I read through the entire Gospel of Mark that night. But let me tell you, I was not thinking this is the answer. I just thought I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands and I better pass it somehow. But as we know... At Phoenix Seminary, what we have in our hands, the very book from which we teach, we base our life on, our ministry on, it is not just ink on paper, but what we have in our Bibles, ladies and gentlemen, is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion. And it wasn't a pretty sight, and I thought things going to get worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. I was handcuffed. My hands were chained around my waist. My feet were shackled together. I shuffled into her office. She shut the door behind me, sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words. She couldn't even give me eye contact. So she resigned to writing something on a piece of paper, slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down, and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read H I V. Positive. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years better than 10 years to life. But news of my HIV status, that I had contracted the AIDS virus that has no cure, felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed, just contemplating the mess that I've made of my life. I lie there and I look up at the cold metal bunk above me. There was graffiti, profanity, gang symbols. Someone had written something else in the corner. And it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 
29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Judah, to tell me that if God could have a plan for Judah in rebellion, in exile, he may even still have a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me. But God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. I wish I could tell you that at that moment I said a sinner's prayer and then everything after that was perfect, like no more problems. (laughs) Far from the truth. God began convicting me of my dependencies. I had many idols. The most obvious was drugs. But within a few months he delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing my other idols and there was just this one thing that I felt like I just couldn't let go of my sexuality. I was reading through the Bible and it was so clear to me that God loved me unconditionally. But as I kept reading, I came across some passages, three in the Old Testament, three in the New, that seemed to condemn this core part of who I thought I was, my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain and I asked him his opinion. Remember, I'm a brand new Christian. I know very little about the Bible. And I thought, I need to ask someone who studied the Bible, knows the Bible, even went to cemetery, seminary. <laughs> The chaplain. (laughs) And to my surprise, this chaplain actually told me the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. And he even gave me a book explaining that view. So think about it. With much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for same-sex relationships. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. Let me just tell you from a human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God and his word. I couldn't even finish that book. And I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for justification. I wanted to find any shred of evidence, any single verse that might bless a monogamous same-sex relationship. So I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked and I looked and I looked. And I couldn't find any. So I was at a turning point, a crossroads. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or... Abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship. How? By freeing myself from a sexuality, by not allowing my desires to control who I am and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality does not have to be, actually shouldn't be, the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally. Uh, That's absolutely true. But as sinners, we want to add to God's truth, don't we? I added, so therefore God doesn't want me to change. Similarly to your friends who might say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading the Bible, I learned that unconditional love... It's not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. 
Let me say it again. Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. Before I become a Christian, I was under the false impression to become a Christian, I had to become a heterosexual. Uh, What does that mean? I need to be sexually attracted to the opposite sex, even as a single man. I was under also the impression that the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if a man had opposite sex attractions, he would still need to flee temptation and resist sin. So heterosexuality, it's the right direction. It's just, a not, it's just not the right goal. Whereas homosexuality is fully wrong, heterosexuality is not fully right. God never commands us, be heterosexual for I am heterosexual. But neither did God ever say, be homosexual for I am homosexual. They're both secular Freudian categories. And instead, God says, be holy, for I am holy. Thus, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That is not the right goal. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling or whether I'm tempted, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity because change is not the absence of temptations. God doesn't promise you come to Jesus and you never be tempted again. Jesus himself was tempted in every way, the writer of Hebrews says, but he's without sin. So change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling or whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life. And he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison. Where did God call you when you were in prison? Or, or, or not in prison, to ministry. That, hopefully you were, yeah, if you were, praise the Lord, we were both in Yale together. <laughs> But um, so he called me to ministry while I was in prison of all places. And I realized that if I was going to continue on in ministry, I better learn more about the Bible. So I called him, collected my parents, and I told them, I think God's calling me to ministry. And then I asked them to mail me an application to Moody Bible Institute. But there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. They mailed the application into me to prison. I was really excited when I got it. Tore open, began filling it out until I realized I needed references. I had some slim pickings in prison, <laughs> but I was able to persuade, persuade a prison chaplain, a prison uh, cha- uh, a guard, and another prison inmate. So amazingly, I was accepted. I was released from prison July of 2001, started the very next month in August. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> I graduated from Moody 2005, went on to my master's in Exodus 2007, received my doctorate of ministry in 2014. And then back in 2011, I had the immense privilege of co-authoring a book with mom called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. So this book, um, it's in seven different languages. And actually we found out that several Christian schools are using it as a textbook. Who would have thought that our testimony is now a textbook? Until we realize all the books our kids are being read beginning in pre-K. I don't know what you believe, but I'm convinced the job to teach sex ed doesn't belong in the hands of public schools. It also doesn't belong in the hands of Google, Disney, or TikTok. Who holds that responsibility? Parents. So how y'all how y'all doing? As many of you at Phoenix Seminary, you're called to ministry. The state where we are today, a program is not the answer. Just simply to do something, well, let's 
even have a series for youth to talk on sexuality. That, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but not the answer. You might have that once a year at the most. Is that enough when our kids are getting bombarded on a daily basis? And I know some of you even are thinking, you know, when is it too young? And, and, and let me back up. It's not just parents. Because like I said, you know, how are you guys doing? Parents, you need help. You know who else God has ordained to be discipling our kids on biblical sexuality? Not just parents, but grandparents. Are there any grandparents in this room? You know why I'm adding you to the list? Because you have too much time on your hands. <laughs> Every time you guys laugh, what do you mean? I have no time. But here's the reason. Maybe, Grandpa, right now you might have more of a listening ear to the grandkids than the parents do. Are we using it or are we just wasting our time? You're having fun with your grandkids. Have fun, but be very clear. Having fun will not save our grandkids when they are drowning in a tsunami of lies. I hate to be an alarmist, but once the world started come for a three-year-olds, it's over. I'm not even a parent, and it's over. We can no longer be nice anymore and say we just need to be nice. I'm not talking about how we reach out in evangelism, but when it comes to our kids, don't come for our kids. Any mama bears out there? It's time. Not only parents, but grandparents, because it's all hands on deck. Amen? So that the world has taken their responsibility from us, I think it's time we take it back. Anyone want to take it back? It's time we take it back. And so pastors, those of you that are called to ministry, we realize the answer is not simply... But we have to equip our parents. And so I wrote my newest book uh, called Holy Sexuality uh, and the Gospel. It's the black and white book. And I intentionally did that, not because I couldn't think of anything else in uh, any other colors. I intentionally did that black and white. Why? Even our church, evangelical Bible-believing churches, were like, we're, just, we're living in, in gray. It's even, it's even in the name of a book. There can be some things that are gray, but when it comes to sexuality, there is no gray. And when we talk about that with our youth, my homiletics professor in Bible college said something. You might have heard something like this before. If there is a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pews. Our pulpits today are not only misty, but the fog has reached the pulpit. We need clarity. Because clarity is being full of grace and full of truth. Clarity is Jesus. So this is the newest book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. It was named 2020 Book of the Year for Social Issues by Outreach Magazine. And I wrote this book because I think there's been other books uh, that's been uh, testimonies, great. And then some books, um, kind of some exegetical analysis books talking about these six passages to affirm that same-sex relationships are not God's will, that they are sinful. And then some books that were some practical theology. But what I saw completely missing in all these books, you know, testimonies, and then kind of some exegetical books, and then practical theology, what was missing? Where's the systematic and biblical theology on sexuality? Nothing, really. So that was my goal, to, in, in essence, develop a theology of sexuality, where we understand temptations, desires, singleness, marriage, um, this concept. It, what's, what's the goal for, holy, uh, for biblical sexuality? Holy sexuality, which is chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Because oftentimes, our message to our kids is this. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Important to teach our kids. But we can't stop there, because you can't build a Christian life just on God's no. What is God's Yes. We need to learn both God's no and God's yes, which when it comes to sexuality is chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And that is good news for all. 
But um, what I also realized is we needed something that would just break the ice in a sense. That would be a tool that would help to kickstart these conversations. Because there's this wall, I believe, between parents and their kids. The teens have no problem talking about sex with their, teen, with their peers, with their school counselors, which please don't talk to your public school counselors on this. They can get online, but I can't talk to my parents. I can't talk to my grandparents. We need to change that. And most of the resources out there are, are the series for, you know, to show to maybe the classroom or the youth group room. And instead of doing it in the classroom, I think we need to be having these conversations in the living room, dining room, and family room. So for the past three years, uh, a team of us, uh, our ministry team has been working to develop what we just released a few months ago. It's called the Holy Sexuality Project. This is a 12 lesson, 36 videos, uh, 270 minutes of content. It was a big, big, big project. A uh, team of 36 animators, illustrators, um, sound engineers that did a lot of stuff for the Bible Project, if you're familiar with that. So very professional stuff. Uh, this is a $1.2 million project that should cost $300 to $500 per license, as some of the other video projects are in the 200s, but they don't even have animation. But that's not accessible for everyone. That's not accessible for grandparents or stay-at-home, you know, or, or homeschool family or single mom. So my parents and donors have made this available for just $20. That's like, that's not even a trip to Chick-fil-A. Like, I mean, you got waffle fries and that's it. <laughs> so for that $20, you can begin this conversation. A pastor who has, I mean, he had a, doc, a PhD, three masters, and he heard about this, went through this 12 lessons. He did 12 days, two weeks, went through the whole video series with his freshman uh, son and a junior year daughter and began, and, and, the, and, the, and the son began. I was like, Dad, this is so weird. I'm talking to my parents about sex. I get it. Some of you are like, that would be me. After the lesson 12, the dad asked the son, do you still feel awkward talking to your parents about sex? He said, no, dad, not at all. That's a win. That's where we want to get to. And so we're super excited about this. I'm going to show a little promo video in, in a moment. But, um, but I want to talk about, and actually I, I did a little bit of an audible um, uh, this morning uh, because of what was kind of in the news. I don't know if you've been following this. Um, to what I see as the most important issue that we miss. Like if there's anything that I could relate to you as someone who was not a Christian, like we weren't even like sort of Christians. We weren't even Christians. Like we didn't, we were nothing. <laughs> We didn't know Bible. I, I never heard the gospel. I didn't know anyone that was a Christian in high school. None of that. I, I was never in the bubble. And then I lived as a gay man. Not like, you know, oh, I was kind of a Christian. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm gay now. And, you know, you hear some of these stories. And No, I was so lost. I was gay, fully, fully in the gay community. This is completely who I am. And now, by God's grace, I'm here. If I could relate to you what I believe we're all missing is this mistake how we have equated sexuality with who you are. And this is important because some of you are familiar. How many of you guys are in seminary or have been to seminary or Bible college or anything like that? I wonder how many of you have ever read this book called The Moral Vision of the New Testament. How many of you guys are familiar with this book? Anyone? When I was in Bible college in 2001, 2005, this was required reading. Uh, that's got an X over it, and there's a, there's a reason for it. But that was the go-to. Every single one of my professors had this book. Every one of us in Bible college had to read this book. This was the go-to to give us a moral vision of the New Testament and lays it all out. And this was, uh, I, I wish I knew the, the year of this, but I want to say it's... It was even before the 2000s. I mean, maybe the 90s. I, don't, I, I should bet, know better. Uh, but before when no one was addressing and defending biblical sexuality and you had people like John Boswell and people just you know, deconstructing all these passages, this was the go-to that responded to that. Richard Hayes, he teaches at Duke University. 
There's a chapter that was the seminal work, that chapter that everyone relied on. Now, after that, we had Robert Gagnon that came out uh, in the 2000s, and then we have Kevin DeYoung's book that is more recent. But that was the best and main go-to. Well, what was just announced two days ago, three days ago? The book on the right is just coming out. And it's called The Widening of God's Mercy. Sexuality within the biblical story written by Christopher Hayes, the son of Richard, who teaches at Fuller Seminary. And if you're going to ask me a question and answer on that, I'll be honest about that. But um, and then Richard Hayes, the father. So what is this book about? Well, let me tell you. This is, we just took the screenshot from uh, that really prestigious conservative biblical um, publishing house called Yale. Publishing house. A fresh, deeply biblical account of God's expanding grace and mercy, developing a theological framework for the full inclusion of what? LGBTQ people in Christian communities. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you this is because I wanted to help uh, to see, because there's going to be a lot of responses to this, definitely, and we're going to critique his hermeneutics and his exegesis. Now, and, and this book, basically what he was doing is just showing in all the different instances where God has changed his mind. Isn't that a great hermeneutic? But, and there's going to be, I'm I'm sure, some great responses, but I think before we even address his hermeneutic and his poor exegesis, this right here, this error of LGBTQ plus people is where I believe is the first error. Because if this is about people and this is about gay people and lesbian people and trans people, in other words, gender is person and sexuality is person, then why not embrace? When we love the person, then isn't that what we should do to embrace the gay person? And that's the air that I'm talking about, that we have to get right before we can do anything else. We can't even go to step two. Don't pass go. If we don't get this right, we're not going to get anything right. Who am I? Who are you? Who are you? Who are we? We have to understand how we answer this question. Because if we don't get that right, we're gonna, our trajectory is going to be off. And this is, I'm not talking about the mainline denominations. I'm talking about here in our own evangelical churches. I can guarantee that in our own churches, Bible-believing evangelical churches, we have pastors, youth pastors, elders, and congregants that are using the wrong framework. Give that a few more years And it is exactly where Richard Hayes is today. Andy Stanley, same thing. Preston Sprinkle, same thing. Just one is a little more ahead than the other. Who am I? How do we answer this important question? For some, we put our identity and answer that question, who am I based on family, friends, or our communities? For others, we put our identity in work. I'm a lawyer. Or maybe in sports, I'm a football player. Or hobbies, I'm a gamer. Still others will put, wrongly put their, who they are in their sexuality. I am gay. Or their self-perception, I am trans. Notice the I am statements. I am gay. I am trans. Yet do these substitutes actually describe who we are or something else? And you might wonder, I mean, what's the big deal? You know, me and a few others have been kind of 
talking on this, Rosaria Butterfield, a good friend of mine, we've been talking about this, especially on this essence, this, this error of making sexuality your essence for years. And oftentimes we're, we're kind of accused of making a mountain out of molehill. Like we're just quibbling over words. That's the most common one. We're just quibbling over words. And I'll admit we are quibbling over words or we're quibbling over the word of God. Don't minimize words. Words matter. Words is what we use to communicate. And last time I checked, words is what God uses to communicate truth. So are we quibbling over words? Absolutely, because we're quibbling over truth. And we're quibbling over the word of God and the living word himself. This is about Jesus. Because this is so important, how we all answer this question, who am I? And it's not just on sexuality. I don't want to just kind of just, oh, well, I'm just park, you know, picking on this or picking on that. This is actually for all of us. How we all answer this question, who am I, it impacts, it impacts everything. It impacts the thoughts we have, the choices we make, and the relationships we build. How we answer this question, who am I, it affects our thoughts, our choices, our relationships. Revealing this close relationship between essence and ethics. So who we are, essence, impacts how we live, ethics. And vice versa, how we live impacts who we are. So if you have a flawed view of who you are, you're going to have a flawed personal ethic. And if you have a flawed personal ethic, you're going to have a flawed view of who you are. So if I said I'm a partier, is that going to Im impact how I live? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. What if a person says, I am a lawyer? Is that going to influence what she thinks about? She's going to think a lot about law. Or if a person says, I'm a football player, is that going to influence the choices he makes? On his free time, he's going to play practice football. Or if a person says, I'm a gamer, is that, not, is that going to impact the relationship she builds? Most of her friends will be gamers. Our thoughts, our choices, our relationships are shaped by how we all answer this question. So personhood affects practice. Practice affects personhood. When I identified as a gay man before my conversion, my whole world was gay. That affected my thoughts, my choices, my relationships. As a matter of fact, all my friends were gay men. I lived in an apartment complex in Midtown Atlanta that was 90 to 95% gay men. I worked out at a gay gym. I bought my groceries at what we nicknamed the Gay Kroger. I bought my new sports car from a gay car dealership. My bookkeeper was gay. My housekeeper was gay. Everything and everyone around me was affirming what my flesh was saying. I am. Get that. The I am statement. I am gay. You see, this has to come before discussing sinful behavior. This has to come before even addressing that. Some of you might have a loved one, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker that identifies as gay or lesbian, trans, etc. And maybe you've had that unfortunate experience where you've brought it up or they've brought it up and we've said it's sin. What's the response? They're so offended, right? So offended. And, and we're like, why? I, I'm just, I'm calling that this is sinful behavior. Why are they so offended? Here's why. How can I talk to someone that this is, this is sinful behavior when they don't even view it as behavior? It's not behavior. It's who I am. So 20 years ago, if we were to go back in time and we were to meet, and I'm just, I am a gay man. I was proud and out. And we were to have this conversation, and you would tell me this is sin. I would not hear you say, what I'm doing is sin. Got it. No. I would not hear you say, oh, the desires or the relationship that I have, that's sinful. No, no. I would hear you say that my whole person from head to toe is reprehensible to you and to God. See, before I knew Christ, I could not hate my sin without hating myself. Now that I know Christ, I can hate my sin without hating myself. And when we are encouraging believers, I'm not talking about like we need to, you know, hit people over the head in the gay community. No, I'm not talking about evangelism. What I'm talking about is the church. When within the church, we are encouraging, not, not only not discouraging, but actually encouraging people 
you know, you're gay. Oh, that's awesome. Just don't act on it. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. You know, and, 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 and we're not helping people to like die to self. And, and, even, um, and, and even thinking that, well, you know, uh, this is, this is it, it just means same sex attracted. I, I hear Christian leaders, they're like, oh, well, gay only means same sex attracted. I can, pretty def- I can definitively say, as a man, before I knew Christ, I was never in the Christian bubble, as a man who completely and fully lived as a gay man, I can tell you, gay does not mean same-sex attracted. You can ask any of your unbelieving gay friends, what does gay mean? Not one will say it means same-sex attracted. I, I never even heard of that phrase before, same-sex attracted. What is that? What do they mean when they say, I am gay? They mean, this is who I am. And so we have to differentiate. We cannot use the same framework and just put a Christian veneer on it. If this is the wrong framework that points not to freedom that we have in Christ, we need to recognize. Even so, when people are like, well, you know, no, gay doesn't mean that. Well, we actually put a verb before gay. And note that it's not doing gay or feeling gay. What is it? It's being gay. And what does being mean? Nothing other than who I am. Being gay. So being gay today means, and wrongly is, means who I am. And that reveals this deep philosophical and theological misunderstanding. It's actually a faulty presupposition. It's a faulty starting point that points to our essence, to the core of our being. So being gay no longer means what I'm attracted to, what I desire, what I do. It is fully and wrongly become who I am. And in this whole conversation around sexuality, the subtle shift from what to who, what I do, what I feel to who I am, has created this radically distorted view of personhood. But I don't know of any other feeling that we've made it who we are. Take, for example, if someone were to say, I am happy. Would we ever think that is who you are? No. Well, unless they're a dwarf and they hang out with six other dwarfs and Snow White, (laughs) then maybe. But besides that, no, that's what you feel. Fantastic. But let's go to the other side of the spectrum. Not I am happy, but I am depressed. In a room like this, I'm sure some of you wrestle with depression. We have loved ones who struggle with depression. If someone would ever confide with you and say, I am depressed, should we ever say, that is who you are? Yes or no? Let's all say together, no. No. You can mark that down in your pastoral counseling class, right? Don't say that. But Listen to my logic here, or listen to the logic of the world. I know several people who identify as gay, and they say, I didn't choose this, so it's who I am. Anyone have friends who say that? I didn't choose this. Do people choose depression? Yes or no? So it's who they are. Or, I know people raised in the church, They leave their faith and they identify as gay or lesbian or trans, non-binary, et cetera. And and you know what they'll say? They will say, I prayed and prayed for God to take it away. And he didn't. So God made me this way. Anyone have friends or loved ones who say that? I know people, Christians, who struggle with depression and they prayed for God to take it away. Now, can he? Absolutely. Does he always? No. No. So when he doesn't, that means that God made them that way. See, regardless of whether you, had, you, you didn't choose it or not, regardless of whether you prayed and prayed and God didn't take it away or not, regardless of whether you had it for as long as you remember, it is not who you are. So let's take maybe an action, a behavior, a sinful behavior. So maybe you know someone who gossips a lot. You're a gossiper. When we say that, do we mean that's who you are? No, that's what you do, so stop it. 
or, or an adulteress? Is that who she is or what she has done? But when it comes to gay, we have completely and wrongly in the church even distorted this to be who a person is. So actually, um, so if sexuality is not who we are, then what is it? Sexuality is not who we are, but how we feel. And when we make it who we are, it's actually an error of, it's a categorical fallacy that ultimately distorts how we think, the choices we make, and the relationships we build. It affects our whole lives. So we are not simply quibbling over words. This is about lives. So the term heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, I mean the whole spectrum. Actually, these terms turn desire into personhood, experience into essence. As a matter of fact, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, all of that doesn't describe people. It describes our experience, our feelings, our desires, our actions. And so today, though, the only thing that matters is our experience, our feelings, our thoughts. And experience reigns supreme and everything needs to bow down before it. So whereas, you know, we used to be sola scriptura, we're no longer that anymore. What we are today is sola experientia. Even in the church. Where we have conferences where it's like, well, let's just hear a bunch of stories. We need to listen to people. But are we listening more to man or to God? So who am I? Who are you? Who are we? See, we have to answer this question correctly to understand human sexuality. Because if we want to understand human sexuality, we need to understand humans. Who are we? And theology has been doing that for millennia. To understand human sexuality, we need to begin with theological anthropology. Now... I'm at Phoenix Seminary, so we know that. But for those who are guests, theological anthropology. I know it's a big phrase, but if you break it down, it's quite simple. Anthropology is a study of humanity. Theological anthropology is one that's doing anthropology the correct way. Because anthropology in general begins with the wrong premise. And what's that premise? There is no God. And so basically, anthropology in our secular universities is just a self-study. It's human beings studying other human beings. It's a self-analysis looking at cultural, you know, comparison, you know, all of this. But you can't, a self-study is very limited. What we need is actually some help. How about our creator? That's theological anthropology. And two important things that I think help us to better understand human sexuality. Number one, we're all created in the image of God. And number two, we are all sinners. Starting there is important to better understand human sexuality. How? Four things. Number one, beginning with theological anthropology, it rebukes the arrogant condemner. You might have an uncle or a cousin that frowns down their nose at those gay people. They're ruining our country. No sin is ruining our country. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. The gay community, they are not our enemies. And even if they were, what does Jesus say about our enemies? Love your enemies. Regardless of anyone's age, sex, or ethnicity, regardless of whether someone is submission to God or not, regardless of whether someone identifies wrongly with their sexuality or gender or self-perception, everyone is created in the image of God. So when we say that people should be treated with, with respect, it's not because of our commitment to, commitment to social justice. It's because every one of us is created in the image of God. The image of God is actually the only true foundation for justice. Second, beginning with theological anthropology, it avoids a common incorrect diagnosis. Now, I don't know if anyone had heard something like this before, but it goes like this. The root causes of homosexuality are an absentee father, dominant mother, or abuse in one's childhood. Anyone heard something like that before? Now, it's very important to deal with trauma in your life. 
if you've had issues in the past, unforgiveness, if you've been abused, heaven forbid, that will impact you now today. It will influence you in negative ways. I don't argue with that. And should we seek help for that? Absolutely. But I want to be very biblically clear. That is not the cause for your sin. Where do we get that concept? That, that what you struggle with today as an adult is rooted in your childhood development. Where, where would we get something like that? Sigmund Freud. And why is it that Christians are sometimes more busy chasing after Freud than chasing after Jesus? What does the Bible say? The Bible is our final authority. And what does scripture say, especially when it speaks on this topic? Like we're not talking about computers or something like that. We're talking about sexual immorality. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? It's sin. So then, let's then ask that question again. What's the root cause of any sinful behavior? So like if you struggle with lying, What's the root cause of that? Like you struggle with gossiping. What's the, if you struggle with pornography, what's the root cause of that? Your mom. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that, I mean, when I say it like that, doesn't that just sound like, okay, wait a second. And yet, aren't we buying into this? You see how we need to call out, and why is this so important? Because if we make the wrong diagnosis, you will have the wrong treatment. Because if your childhood is the cause for your sinful behavior, then instead of sending Jesus, God would have sent us a support group. And not that support is helpful, but God already provided that support group, and it's called the local church. Scripture is very clear. This is sinful behavior. And scripture is also very clear that the root cause of sinful behavior is one thing. Our sin nature. We can't push the blame because when we do, that's the same mistake done in the garden. It's the woman you gave me. And what did Eve say? She didn't do much better. It's the snake. And we keep pushing the blame, don't we? We just need to stop and recognize I'm responsible for my own sin and it does not help me to push the blame. Because when we realize the root cause and diagnosis correctly, we will come up with the right solution. Sin is the problem. Jesus Christ is the answer. Not Jesus plus, not Jesus maybe, not Jesus and, Jesus Christ alone. Solus Christus Christ alone. And this has very important ramifications for those of us in this room, those of you that's, that's in this room that are parents. Maybe you have a wayward child. I mean, we all have wayward children. Maybe your child identifies as lesbian, non-binary, queer. And you've raised them knowing and fearing the Lord, but they've walked away. And you continuously blame yourself. What did I do wrong? If you take nothing else tonight, please take this away. It's not your fault. Perfect parenting never guarantees perfect children. Look at Adam and Eve. Did they not have a perfect father? Yes or no? Didn't they have a perfect environment? You couldn't get more perfect than the Garden of Eden. They still rebelled. So what makes you think, dad or mom, you can do better than God? You know, the job of a Christian parent is not to produce godly children. It's not your job, because if it was your job, you could do it, and you can't do that. Because if you could, you'd be God. And here's a secret, you're not God. 
The job of a Christian parent is not to produce godly children. The job of a Christian parent is just to be a godly parent. You be godly. You pray your heart out that your children would follow Jesus. You do everything you can to point your kids to Jesus, but then let God be God. Last time I checked, there's only one person who can save your kids, and it's not you. His name is Jesus. Amen? It's not your fault. We're created in God's image, but we're also all fallen third. And whereas the second one um, is kind of the, the older model, the ex-gay framework that we need to kind of just correct, I think that's kind of going away, but the most hip, common, popular thing right now in the church today is what I want to address here, and it is this kind of this sort of, you know, well, I'm not too sure what they're really saying, and it seems right, and they're gay, but they're just celibate. We call this the side B movement, the spiritual friendship movement, the revoice with advocates, you know, that are just making things really popular. Press and Sprinkle, very much one. And we're like, well, but don't they hold to traditional sexual ethic? They're not encouraging. They're saying that marriage between a man and a woman, much like Andy Stanley did, didn't he? See, Satan cushions his lies with truth. Sounds right, but is it really? Yes, don't act on it. Yes, good, but is that it? I'll just be honest, I used to think that. I used to think, okay, when I'm tempted like this, when I have these desires, don't act. Until I read the Bible. Specifically, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, where Jesus says, if a man looks lustfully at a woman, he's fine as long as he doesn't act on it. Is that what Jesus says? Is that, help me out, I'm, I'm forgetting a little here. Is that what Jesus says? No, what does he say? If a man looks lustfully at a woman, what, help me out here. He has already committed adultery. So is it just don't act? Is that our message? Is that calling people to full, true repentance? Because that's what this is about. Are we calling people to repentance? Because there's only hope that we have for calling people to Jesus Christ and salvation and that leads to repentance. If we're not calling people to repentance, that we're not calling them to Jesus. Because this is repentance of not only the act, but also these desires and anything else that has to do with our, we don't kind of embrace our sin nature and say, yes, this is who I am. Let's celebrate it. Let's see if I can wrap a bow on it and sanctify it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say sanctify your sin nature, but mortify it. Put it to death. And when we have these views, that's when we come up with these concepts like, well, it just don't act. So for, therefore, a gay man and another gay man can be in a relationship and, this is, and just call it not gay marriage, but just call it a spiritual friendship. See, that sounds right. Like, well, friendship, what's wrong with friendship? Until we realize what actually being promoted is two same-sex attracted men actually having a covenant together. Like, it's even a ceremony in these churches. And then they live together, they own property together, they sleep together, but they don't have sex. And that's fine, right? They're not having sex. I mean, wives, ladies, would you be fine if your husband had a nice little relationship with another woman? Not you. Hold hands, sleep with her when he's visiting some other state, and, but he's not having sex. That's okay, right? You're okay with that? You see how the enemy just slips in? Did God really say? So we have to recognize that are we calling people to true freedom in Christ or are we calling them to bondage? I feel like where we are today, we're not where we were 20 years ago where it was the church, we need to be more gracious. That's what, if, if, if I was around 20 years ago and I was preaching to you, I'd be like, you know what? We're not getting this right. We're just truth is expensive grace. Where are we today? Where are our kids today? Are they just all truth is expensive grace? All they hear is love is love. You do you. 
They never knew a time where biblical sexuality was accepted. So it's not the same as it was 20 years ago. So what we need today is not just grace. What we need is more of Jesus. We need to be full of grace and full of truth. So I don't identify as a gay man. You should not identify as a lying Christian. If you struggle, if you struggle with pornography, you are not a porn watching Christian. If you struggle with gossiping, don't put on your name tag, I'm a gossiping Christian. I'm not an adulterous Christian or whatever it is. I am not a gay Christian. That is my dead man. And no one is going to resuscitate him. So we point to the freedom that we have in Christ because we identify with Christ who is life and not sin and death. And lastly, beginning with theological anthropology, and, and this is why I, I pointed back to the Richard Hayes. See, he made that mistake and that's been brewing. Because I think so he's part of the United Methodist Church. And, and even before, I mean, of course, there's really basically two. If you're looking at the mainline denominations, yes, it's, it's departure from the authority of God, from Scripture. Big time. But what I see as another big heinous error is where the church stopped disciplining you are not a church when you're not doing redemptive discipline. Look at the UMC, right? I mean, didn't they decide in the right direction three or four or five years ago, whatever it was? Maybe it was less than that, three or four years ago. But what did they not do when the churches here in the United States kept doing all these things and, and, and ordain, ordaining gay and lesbian, openly gay? What did they do? They refused to discipline. And this movement right now like, uh, you know, the revoice movement of side B, they refuse to discipline. If we're refusing to discipline, then we're not calling people to repentance. I want to call people to repentance. Like, if you are my good friend and you're not calling me to repentance in, in my sin, you are not loving me. Love is pointing people to repentance. And lastly, beginning with theological anthropology, helps us to answer the born gay question. Um, you know, are people born gay? Is, is this, um, you know, the, uh, did God make them this way? And, and maybe the Bible doesn't really address this. And actually, there's a lot of research and data and, and that, that's on this, you know, is it, is it genetics, is it whatever? And actually, you know, uh, with all the studies that I've did uh, and, and looking at that, there's not a single study that's been replicated and confirmed. So actually, it's still out. We just don't know. So are people born gay? And does the Bible not address this? So even though people wrongly think they're born gay, and the science is still out on this, Jesus has an answer for it. Because even though people might wrongly think they're born gay, Jesus says, you must be born again. You might think you're born an alcoholic. You must be born again. You might, be, you might think you're born a liar or a cheater. You must be born again. You may think you're born a you fill in the blank. You must be born again. The old is gone. The new is come in Christ. You're a new Christian. That is not a message just for the gay community. That is a message for the whole world. You must be born again. Now, I know many of you might not have heard a story like mine before, a guy who used to identify as gay and now no longer do, and that's an important part of my story. But that's not how I best summarize it. This is how I summarize it. I once was blind, and now I see. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I once did not believe, and now I believe in the Son of God, and his name is Jesus. That's my testimony. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord, it is only through him that we can be reconciled to you, a holy God, and even now be able to be called heirs and to be called sons. 
and daughters and call you Abba. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the good news. And I pray, Lord, that we would not hold it to ourselves, but we would proclaim this good news to others. I pray for parents here. I pray for grandparents here that we would rise up and take our place to disciple our kids, our grandkids, our little ones. And I pray for parents of prodigals, Lord, that you would encourage them, that you and you alone save that your arm is not too short. So we pray for the impossible because you do the impossible. We praise you, Father. We pray for Phoenix Seminary to continue to be the light, whereas over several decades, many seminaries came and gone and started off strong and now have become teaching false teaching. I pray for the spiritual integrity of Phoenix Seminary, Lord, to be a beacon of light and hope here in Phoenix, Arizona, the U.S., and the world. God, we thank you. We praise you. But help us, oh God, to love you more than life. For it's in the matchless, powerful name of Jesus, we pray. And the people of God said, amen.